So, 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 Coach, uh, you know, th- thanks for doing this. We've been trying to get together for a while. It looks like, looks like it's finally <laughs> going to happen today. Um, uh, we were uh, the last time I saw you was at a regional game uh, at George Mason, and I was a couple uh, rows in front of you, behind you, and I spoke to you, and you said Julian Brown, class of '84, Robinson, and I couldn't believe that you recognized me, and knew who <laughs> I was, because because I, you know, I was a very mediocre player, and uh, but uh. But it turns out a lot of people have read Coach Red Jiggins' stories like that. I think um, it means a lot to people. So I really appreciate I really appreciate you knowing who I was that day, and I appreciate you doing this uh, uh, podcast today. Who was your coach? Was Charlie Thompson your coach? No, I was there before, before Charlie. So I, I I was his summer league coach one year, but I, I played for Bob McKegg. Yeah. and so yes. I, uh, yes. on my team. We had uh, Jeff Bowling was our starting point guard. Me and Jeff would play together a lot, and then we had Chris Warren, right. and then yes. we had Joel, we had Joel Dempsey played football at UVA. Yeah. Um, he was he was a good player as well. So uh, Glenn Pixton and Kurt Collier also played. So uh, in the year before, I played with a guy named Kevin Leisure, Chris Harriman. They're pretty good players. So, right. but 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 it, anyway, Coach, uh, uh, thanks a lot for doing this. How, how, how have you been doing? I'm doing fine. Just if I can stay out of the damn 93 degree, degree heat and, and, and keep my yard work confined to the mornings, I'm all right. So you're still doing your own yard work, huh? Yeah, I don't want to hire somebody to cut. My son, my son lives with us and cuts the grass and is a big help around here. So I don't have too much to do. Mostly just whatever little chores my wife has to do, like cut some plants off before they go to seed and some stuff like that. You know, silly stuff. That's, that's great. Um, so, you know, I had, I had done a podcast um, of the 1984 Final Four. I don't, know, I don't know if you heard it, but it was Derek Hensley, uh, Coach Carl Hensley's son from Lake yes. Braddock, Frank Smith, and we had uh, Calvin Wood from TC. And one thing Derek said, um, we were talking about how much high school basketball meant in those days. And one thing Derek said is they, they would go to Pizza Hut after, after a big game. And he, they would get a standing ovation when they when they would come into the pizza. Hut. High school basketball meant so much in those days, and they probably meant even more earlier. Do you uh, nowadays with social media and the way that uh, the private schools have taken, or a lot of the kids have gone to private school? Do you think if you were a twenty five year old guy these days, you would have gotten into high school coaching? Yeah, probably, but maybe I wouldn't have lasted too long because the parents. Uh, you know, they 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 want to interfere in your program and send you emails. I wouldn't I wouldn't do that. So if it came down to that, and the principal said you got to listen to these parents, I'd have to retire because I I'd, I'd love to do it, but probably I wouldn't start in a public school. I if I was 25 years old, I was hired at Woodson as a head coach when I was just 25. I had three years of at Annandale as a as Harry Smith's assistant and head JV coach, and then. I went to Woodson and stayed there 35 years, and then Paul was six for four. It, it's it's changed. Morgan Wooten told me one time that we were fortunate because we I played in the mid 50s and started coaching in the late 50s, and he said the golden age of high school basketball ended uh, at uh, just before 2000. If you coached in that 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 40 some years was a golden age of high school basketball. Now. Uh, the crowds aren't as big. Uh, it's not as important as you say, and the parents—they're uh, only interested in their son getting playing time, whether he can play or not. You know, uh, it's just a different—it's a different atmosphere and a different game, and it's—it's it's one that I'm glad I'm not in right now. Yeah, par- uh, coaches like yourself—you guys were gods. I mean, when guys like you and Coach Hensley and uh, Coach uh, Wendell Bird, Coach Bird, Coach Thompson. When you guys walked around, you were celebrities in the area. Parents, we didn't. Uh, parents did not feel like they could call the coach up and complain about par- uh, playing time. My parents couldn't have called Coach McKeg uh, and talked about playing time. Um, no. So, so when when did it change, and when did parents start acting like that? Well, I don't know. Uh, I, 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 when I went to Paul the Six, when I was at Woodson, you see, during the time I was at Woodson. The players we had over over 50 players played Division One, and another 30 played Division Two or Three. And and at one time we counted it up, and the kids that played at Woodson had earned. And these at at rates when it only cost uh, 
5,000 a year to go to school. We figured it up that the guys that went on full scholarship division one and two, it added up to over $2 million. So when parents were saving that kind of money, uh, and they, they figured you must be doing something right. What I liked, what I liked then was, and uh, we had, I had, I had two parent complaints in 35 years at Woodson, and and both of it involved playing time because they thought their son should be playing. So the, a story that I heard, Frank Ferguson, who coached at Fairfax when I started at Woodson in 1962, was a really good coach. He and Al McGuire were good friends. He's from Long Island, New York. He said. Here's what you do. He said, a guy complained to him about playing time one time. And he said, well, tell you what. He said, come on up on Saturday morning. I'll set up a scrimmage and you can see how your son stacks up against the other guys. So the guy came up there and his son, who wasn't a very good player, the other players ate his breakfast for him and fed it to him. And, the, and as the parent was going out the door, he just waved and said, I see what you mean. So, you know, you can't do those kinds of things these days because – they, all, they don't want to come and meet you face to face. They want to send you email. They want to go to the principal. They want to go to the athletic director and complain. I guess that changed after, you know, 2000. And, of course, when I went to Paula Six, it was a whole different game. You know, they Paula Six had never won a game across the river, and they were in the league with DeMath and St. John's and all those people. And uh, when I went there, Morgan Wooten told me that they had played Paula Six the year before, and – uh, Paul of six was down 40 and their players were sitting on the pen, on the bench laughing about it. And when I went over there, we sort of changed the attitude. We brought in some players, but they never bought into what I wanted to do. But the parents were adamantly opposed to me being there because their little kids who played at uh, St. Timothy's and St. Leo's had been used to playing. And now we, we got some players in and uh, we, in my third year, the math would beat us by one game for the championship. So we changed it dramatically, but they never liked it. And, and, and to be honest with you, uh, it was uh, somewhat of a racial thing. See, they didn't like the idea that we had so many black players and uh, the priest wanted to win. So he didn't care if guys were purple and I didn't either. So uh, we never were fully, you know, <laughs> uh, received over there. And after three years, when the priest left, I should have gone with him, but uh, I stayed one year out under the lay principal, and he told me that the money we were spending on need, and we had a lot of poor kids. That's how we were able, <clears throat> how we were able to get them there. I think it amounted to like $16,000 in aid, you know, uh, when DeMath and Gonzaga have a million-dollar annuity that they can bring in anybody they want any time. We were struggling, and he wanted to take my last sixteen dollars or $20,000 I had for need money, so that's when I left. But I'd say that early, the early 2000s are when it changed, when uh, when parents begin to take on a bigger role. You know, everybody, they all think that their kid's the greatest player, you know, going. And, you know, and yet when it comes down to it, they don't get any scholarship offers or nobody comes to see them play. You were a bad coach. It's, it's kind of a crazy thing. But like I say, I'm just glad I'm not in it. Mm. So, 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 Coach, let's, let's go back to the beginning. Where, where were you raised? I, I was born in a small town in the coal fields of West Virginia, Beckley, West Virginia. It's about uh, 50 miles up from uh, from Bluefield, which is on the border between Virginia and West Virginia. And I was raised sort of in a in a coal mining atmosphere. I stayed there for 10 years and my mother got remarried and uh, came to Washington, D.C. when I was in the fifth grade. Okay. So did you play did you play basketball in Beckley? Because uh, that, that's a really rich basketball area, the Beckley area. West Virginia was so far ahead of Virginia. When I was in the third grade, I started playing basketball. Uh, the principal held practices at lunchtime, and the object, we had a sixth grade team, and the object was he would keep some fifth graders on his sixth grade team. And so I was so proud that I went up and practiced every day, and, and I made the team. Uh, he only kept eight guys, and I made the team. As a, as a fifth grader, and I, he took me on one trip over to Sofia. I got in the game for about three or four minutes and had one assist, and I was really pleased. And then my mother called the same day and said, you're coming to D.C., so I had to leave. But they had we had a 14-team elementary school league. Where everybody had a sixth-grade team, 14 schools in, in Raleigh County. It was Basketball was big in West Virginia, not so big, not so big here in Virginia. Wow. Well, when I, when I was, uh, I went to team camp at, at UVA 
my senior year and, I, and we met these these boys from Mullins, West Virginia, yeah. and they were they were a storied program. Uh, they were a small school, single A school there, but they, they had a guy named Jerome Anderson that played for the Celtics a few years earlier. Yeah. They just had a great program. A guy named Don, got the coach's uh, last name was, but he was a West Virginia legend. So these boys, we had never met boys like this. So they were in the next suite. They were yeah. drinking. They were drinking moonshine and whiskey. They were. They were <laughs> They were playing jokes on each other. They, they were like, you know, from the coal mines, and they were just very. De- and they were the most polite boys. But we got yeah. in that bas- when we got in that basketball court, they were devastating. I mean, we beat them because we were you know, we were a much bigger school, and we had we had a really good team. But I mean, they had a guy named Herbie Brooks. Herbie played for West Virginia. He's yeah. he played with uh, Daryl Prue and uh, yeah, uh, I forgot who else is on the team. But he was a, he was a really good player there. But yeah, Herbie and I are still in contact. So I was I, I always knew about the the coal fields of West Virginia that those were, it was a basketball area. Well, let me let me tell you who grew up in Mullins. Maybe you don't know this, but uh, Mike D'Antoni, who's coached in the NBA for years. That, that's right. And his, bro- and his brother Dan D'Antoni, their dad, uh, Luke. I guess he's, I forget his dad's first name. Coach D'Antoni. Those were his two sons, Mike and Dan. Now Dan. I first met Dan when we got invited to come down to the beach ball classic the year they started it. They played the first year at coastal Carolina. I think this was a 1981 Tommy was a junior. And so we went down on the bus and played in his tournament and got to know Dan real well. And of course, Mike D'Antoni did Tommy Amaker's clinic uh, one year and I had, I spent two days with him and I, I, I correspond with Mike. I text Mike back and forth. Uh, and, we argued a little bit about the three-point shot. You know, he he thinks the three-point shot or a layup are the only shots you should take. But but Mike D'Antoni and Dan D'Antoni were both great players. They both left Mullins and went to Marshall. And one of them still has the scoring record at Marshall. And Danny now has gone back. He was with Mike with the Lakers and with, uh, with the Phoenix Suns. And Danny was, you know, coaching with his brother. Now Danny took the head coaching job at Marshall. Which is where he had, where he is now. But uh, they started that tournament, the Beach Ball Classic. Now it's the biggest Christmas tournament in the country. You know, it's it's uh, huge, huge. Well, I guess if you start kids early, you put them in leagues, you're gonna get you're gonna get some talent. I guess they took it, you know, very seriously at a young age in in that area. Where you, where yeah, you well, right? yeah. Beckley won a number of state champions. The guys that I played against in grade school won three straight state championships after I left. And I probably would have been on that, would have been on one of those teams, you know, but uh, my mother brought me to Washington. And when I came to Washington, I was ready to play basketball. And on the playgrounds, nobody played basketball. They had Redskins, everybody was out throwing a football or the Senators, they were playing baseball early and basketball wasn't a big thing. Of course, Red Auerbach won the, the what was called the BAA, the Basketball Association of America. He won the, in I think 47, because I went down to see all those good teams play. Yeah, they played down at Uline Arena. Uh, they won the championship. and but, but high school basketball really started with Morgan Wooten, really, here. I mean, mm. it was it was pretty good basketball in the old days. But when Morgan, of course, beat Power Memorial, and when he went to DeMatha and brought Ernie Cage with him from, from down in Annapolis, I think, and started really recruiting players and building up, and he built a powerhouse in a short period of time. That's where I first met Morgan. I was coaching the freshman at Gonzaga when I was a, a senior at George Washington University. I was supposed mm-hmm. to play, but I got five teeth knocked out the day before practice started. And so Coach Reinhardt told me, he said, Red, he said, the boys tell me, and he, he, what, he never saw us play. Uh, but he said the boys, uh, that is Gorilla, who went to the Celtics, and Tulaski, who went to the Philadelphia Warriors, and Bucky McDonald, who went to the Pistons, they had three guys drafted in the first round. So I don't think I would have cracked that lineup. But uh, uh, he told me, he said, I got a coaching job. They would need a freshman coach over at Gonzaga. And he said, you wouldn't be able to practice for a couple of weeks. And so he said, you're not going to play much. You're a pretty good player, but you're not going to get to play. You'll sit on the bench. And I said, well, I'd rather coach than sit on the bench. So I started coaching. And that's where I met Morgan uh, when, uh, you know, I guess this was 58. But he had built up a real good program by then. And, uh, of course, uh, I got invited to coach the all-star freshman against the league winner, which was DeMatha's freshman. But the big team was Carroll with John Thompson and Hoover and George Leftwich, best high school team that's ever been around here by a mile and a half. And uh, they played in the 
played against the Catholic League All-Stars and to raise money to go to the national tournament in Rhode Island. But that's when basketball really took off. You see, being out here in Virginia, I was a baseball player. You know, I just went out for the team my senior year. I hadn't played basketball since grade school, really. But, uh, you know, when I started coaching at Gonzaga, I could see that over in D.C. they were serious. And that's, that's why I always had a, a bone to pick with the Virginia High School League. You know, they still don't have a shot clock. They're, they're 40 years behind. I got invited to coach the Virginia All-Stars against Maryland in 1972, and the Virginia High School League wouldn't let me do it. They said it's against our educational principles to, to uh, support All-Star games. So, uh, you know, that's, that's where we were. It was just a sad thing, but Virginia basketball has been behind the eight ball ever since. Now, we've had some really good players over here, like Jim O'Brien and the Hummer brothers and Skeeter Swift and, uh, you know, Grant Hill. We've had some really good players over here. Uh, individually, but as teams, we would never match up with the teams over town. So my feeling was that Virginia High School League is behind. I took my teams to D.C. and put them in the Jell-O Summer League the first year I was at Woodson. I took Annandale's team over there before that uh, and put them in the Summer League. And we always tried to play DeMatha and St. John's every year if we could. Uh, you know, we weren't allowed – we weren't, we were allowed two extra games after a while for a while. We couldn't play, but we always played, and we didn't call it a scrimmage when we always played and we just had a regular four quarter game and, and played and, you know, but uh, I took my team to DC and as it was right now, I got inducted into the Metropolitan Basketball Hall of Fame, I think in 2013 or 14, which was a big thing for me. And even though their coaches in the Virginia, Hall of Fame that have won 300 games uh, and, you know, done nothing really. They're in the Hall of Fame because it's a good old boys club. So I don't really care to be part of that. But the principle is they still they're still mad at me because I was on a committee downstate and we went to John, John Averett from Culpepper and I proposed the, the rules that they have in today, these green rules. We proposed that you could practice from the last day of school till the first day of football practice. You could coach your Legion baseball team. You could coach your summer league team. You could work your guys out in football, could get their guys in shape and, and wouldn't, uh, you wouldn't have any people falling out from heat exhaustion. It was a great idea and the committee loved it. It took it to the principal's council and they voted it down 262 to nothing. So at that point, I just washed my hands of Virginia high school league, you know, so we've had, a, you know, I'm, I'm not in their good graces and they're not in mine. And, they're still behind the times, but I hate to get off on a tangent, but that's, that's the yeah. way things work. Yeah. And then, I mean, this is kind of a side issue, right? You know, yes. that's a big, but going, going to Robinson, you know, we had the regional tournament there. We had a district tournament there for, for many years as well. And then, and then they had the, uh, uh, so, and my sister played at Robinson. She was class 82, really good player. She played against like Helen Baruti and Lorraine. Yeah. She, she played against anyway. So, if, if a kid a kid growing up there, I'd go to the regional games. Then I I I'd go to state and watch state because you know my sister was playing and I just became a fan of the tournament. And then, you know, there was a whole thing when they made six classifications. They did it for football first, but then they did it for basketball, and it and then it really just ruined the tournament because it, the regions had so much um, history behind them. If you if you won the north if you won the northern region, it was a big deal, you know. But you had to you had to deal with the eastern region. You had this you had the Richmond teams in the central region. And then you had this strange Northwest region, like the smaller cities in the Western and Southern part of the state. And it was a great tournament. And then one year they just decided to make six classifications and it kind of threw all that history away from, you know, and I know there's probably reasons the smaller schools couldn't compete. And, but I think you have to be careful when you make, you know, big decisions like that. And I think the high school league, at least in my mind, got that wrong. Well, listen, when you leave it up to the athletic directors and principals, what you have is most people who are, who really don't understand basketball. The best basketball tournament we had when I first started, uh, I was at Annandale, Woodson. The top eight teams in the state came to the Richmond Arena and then later to Charlottesville. Two from each region came down and played a regular eight-team tournament. Now, that was great. I uh, watched WNL win the championship down there. I uh, watched uh, Wakefield win the state championship down. I mean, it really was a great tournament. And then they decided to change things. And they, they, they went to where it just became a final four 
And uh, we were we were in the regional final four years. We were runner up. We never got a chance to go because they only took one team to state. In other words, it mm. was a final four team. So I got cheated out of four trips. And I know at least one of those years, Tommy Amaker, senior year, T.C. Williams beat us by one point at the buzzer. We probably could have won the state championship, but that's neat. And maybe one other time, too. But they changed the rules. Hell, we won the district, the northern district, seven straight years. And the principals had a meeting and decided that Woodson was winning too much. So they voted that uh, the team that won the regular season didn't get anything. But the team that won the tournament uh, would be the representative to the final four in the region. Don't you know the first year that happened? I had a big, tall team that couldn't press anybody. And the other team held the ball. So we got knocked. So they, they've legislated against me from, from day one. So I, like I say, I'm, I'm not... You know, like this current situation. You know what this current situation is about, Julian? It's about race. You see, those teams in Richmond that were AAA and the Tidewater were winning every year, and mostly from the inner city black schools. So the the, the poor little white boys up here in the rich suburbs couldn't couldn't scratch. So they legislated it so that now what do you get? You get two or three chances to go to the state, don't you? Gary Hall called me. When he first saw what they had done, he said, Red, we got really got a good chance to win the state this year because they changed the rules back and put those other teams. I don't know how they how they've done it, but uh, they, they've made it easier for schools like Woodson to win the championship. It's been watered down. You know, it's good. It's good that you get additional participation. And it's good. That, but you know, it's not like the old days. The old days, man, you, if you didn't win it, uh, somebody good beat you. Nowadays, I don't know. Yeah, my, my son uh, made it. They got to the state finals in soccer this year, and they played West Springfield in the state semis. You know, so West Springfield is in a different uh, in a different region than Yorktown is. And then we played. You know, we, we finally played Hilton, so we never went anywhere for our state tournament. But anyway, that's that's uh, yeah. that's soccer. But I want to get back quickly. So, how did you get the job at, at Annandale? Well. Uh, the coaches at Annandale, Ed Henry was a football coach. Uh, he was at Mount Vernon High School. He was our, our football coach at Mount Vernon when I was uh, in, in, in Mount Vernon. And uh, when oh, you I went, was... You went, you went to Mount... I didn't know you went to Mount Vernon. I thought you went to school in D.C. You no. You went to high school... Oh, okay. I, I went to... Came to D.C. when I was 10, 10, 10 years old and spent fifth and sixth grade there. Then my parents bought a house out in Groton. So I went to Groton Elementary as a seventh grader and to Mount Vernon as an eighth grader. So... Ed Henry was our coach, and uh, he happened to be running the teen center uh, at Annandale, and I would go there at night and play. And uh, in high school, I was the seventh man. I played about three minutes a game if I was lucky. But when I went to college, they had a beautiful gymnasium and everything, and I gave up baseball and started working on basketball full time. And where I was a scrub in high school, I started for my college team as a sophomore because I mainly because I grew two inches and gained about 30 pounds and mm-hmm. got got some size. But Ed, uh, I would go there and play at night, and he uh, he was a real good friend, and so uh, he knew I was getting out of George Washington University. He said, "Why don't you come out here and do your practice teaching with us?" And I had to fight the people at GW because they wanted everybody to do their practice teaching. At, uh, in, in Arlington County because it was a highly rated school system. And I told them I might get a job in Fairfax County if I can do it out there. So they finally reluctantly let me do it. And Ed Henry was my critic teacher. And uh, so I guess I did a pretty good job. And they needed some help in basketball. They had a shop teacher coaching the JV and a science teacher coaching the freshmen. The basketball, they just weren't giving the guy any help. And Harry Smith was a heck of a coach. You know, he was the athletic director at Robinson, I think, when you were there. Yeah, but uh, yeah. but uh, Harry needed help, and Ed Henry, where a lot of football coaches would say, no, I want that position for football. He said, Harry needs help, so he decided that they hired me. The happiest day of my life, they came over to Belvedere Elementary, where I was running a summer playground, and told me that I had a contract. So I started at Annandale and was Harry's assistant. We upgraded the program, started an intramural program where we had a lot of open gym in the, in the fall and started emphasizing and uh, two out of the three years I was with him, we were in the regional final four. Of course, Marty Lentz was playing at Mount Vernon then. It was kind of tough to get to the finals. Mount Vernon had Marty, who scored 74 points and still holds the state record for points against Jeb Stewart one night. And uh, 
uh, the Hummer, Ed Hummer was at, uh, was at Mount, uh, at WNL. So we still couldn't get out of Fairfax County, but the program upgraded. And then uh, Ed Henry, again, uh, Emory Chesley was the principal at Woodson. They were starting a new school and they had 35 applications, 34 head coaches from all around the area over in DC and Maryland, everywhere. And I was the only assistant that applied for the job. And Ed, I told Emory Chesley that he thought I would be a good coach in the future and that he'd be smart to hire me. And he wanted a young coach to grow with the program. So I hadn't turned 25 when, when he hired me to be the head coach at Woodson, it was going to be a big school. You know, the third year I was there, we had 3,300 students. So it was a, a job made in heaven. I couldn't have, I couldn't have been more fortunate than the guy that did it all for me was Ed Henry, you know, and uh, mm. you know, he and I were close friends and, I think he's probably the best high school football coach that's ever been around here. I know there's some people who think Danny Meyer's pretty good, and there's some coaches that are pretty good, but uh, Ed Henry was in a class by himself. He went on to college, coached at VMI and then to the University of Virginia. Just a great coach and a, and a very good friend, and uh, I wouldn't be where I am uh, where I was if it wasn't for him because every step of the way he supported me and recommended me and and helped me out. So he lived. He lived four or five doors down from that. I I, uh, I lived there on the corner, not too far from where you live, in the corner of Portsmouth and Sideburn. And of right. course, he lived like he lived like five doors down. I, I knew him. He was. He always uh, said great things. Said, You're going to be a really good running back, Joe. I can't wait for you to get to high school. And <laughs> uh, oh, he was he, he was just an awesome guy. And I, I, yeah. I never played I never played varsity football, but but you know I, I just thought I thought the world of him. And years later. You know, I was uh, on the Hall of Fame committee for Robinson, and right. you know they're they're talking about players, coaches, and stuff in the Hall of Fame. And um, Ed Henry is not in Robinson's Hall of Fame. Really? And I, and I, no. And I, and I was like, you know, I'm, I'm I'm on this end. I'm just sitting there. What is going on? I guess they have all these parameters. You had to win certain things, and and I guess he didn't quite. I guess he didn't quite win those things at Robinson, but he meant so much more to the school. And then what happened later is. You know, after 85, 86, or, you know, there's six classifications. It became yeah. easy. You know, you, you can't judge a coach just on, on, the, on those type of parameters. So it was, it was a, it was a area of frustration for me because anyone who's ever been around him um, knew the kind of coach and the kind of man he was the kind of leader he was, but you know, that's, you know, that's, that's one of those things you have to, you have to accept. Hey, so, so coach, when did you, when did you end up going to Woodson? What year was that? 1962 in the fall of 1962 we opened Woodson brand new school okay. and were you were you guys were you guys good right away well in my first year you see as you know today when they open a new school they play a year of JV sometimes two my athletic director said we need to make money so you want to play a varsity schedule I said sign them up so we played a varsity schedule my first year uh we played not the top teams uh you know, like GW, w. Now, we played WNL's B team and Morris Levin being the sneak that he was, he put two starters on his B team so they could win the game. But we played a matchup zone beating 37-36 and he still hadn't figured that out. But uh, we, we played Lee and, and uh, you know, Madison and Jeb Stewart and, and we played Episcopal. You know, we, we found a varsity schedule, which was good. And we won nine and lost nine. It's probably the best job I've ever done because – we had no size. Uh, you know, our biggest guy was like 6'2". We started three little guards, uh, one of them 5'9", 5'10", 5'11", and a 6'2 guy. And, and we, we, you know, we, we just uh, played a ball control game and, and did a very good job defensively. We played, you know, mixed our defenses up. It was a, a great year for us. But then the second year, the athletic director said, we still got to make money. So now we're going to play GW. We're going to play WNL. We're going to play all the powers. Uh, so it was tough. The second year we were 7 and 11. But Gabe Oliverio moved in from, from Morgantown, West Virginia. So the second year we dipped because of the schedule. But the third year, uh, back in those days, if you made the regional tournament, it was money. You got you, eight teams split the pot. So uh, my third year, we won 13 games and and played GW in the first round, got beat. But uh, Gabe, I think, was the second leading scorer in the region his junior year. And in his senior year, he averaged like 29, and and we were off to the races. And then the fourth year, we went to the state. So, yeah, it was 
it was tough getting started, uh, but, uh, but you know, it was a great, great learning experience. So at the same time, Luther Jackson was getting ready to close in Fairfax. Yep. And for folks who are out there who don't know, Luther Jackson was the, the, black, the black high school in Northern Virginia, in Fairfax County at least. So right. uh, I know you had mentioned on, on the Facebook group that you guys had played a scrimmage with, with, with the players every year. I think the coach's name was George Felton. That's and correct. They, right, and they had a tough – he later became a uh, principal at South Lakes. And they had a really tough player that would eventually play for you named Walter Hawkins. So yes. what, what were what were those games, the scrimmages like? And how did they come to be that you that you played scrimmages against uh, the uh, the black the nearby black high school? Well, uh, I don't know if George and I were friends before or after. I think, you know, I think he called and said, Y'all want to come over and scrimmage? I said, sure. So he had a big kid named Wood the first year we scrimmaged him, but the scrimmages both years went down to the wire. Somebody won by one, somebody won by two, and he and I always argue that he says they beat us, and I say we beat them, so it, it didn't really matter. But the fact is, when uh, when they closed uh, the, the Luther Jackson, and uh, I knew George was going to come with us, uh, one of the players lived in our area, Skip Brandon, and the other two lived in, in the area down by Jeb Stewart, uh, 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 toward Bailey's Crossroads, and that wasn't our area, but uh, he was enrolled in a, in a masonry program, so he ended up coming to our school because of that. So we had two guys, uh, Hawkins and Brandon, who were just outstanding players, and we had a pretty good group there before then. We had Dave Oliverio, who was uh, a junior, and we had a kid named Dave Strong, and we had Dave Marsden, who's Dave is in, in the state Senate now, but he was about 6'4". We had a squad. If I could have had them two years, that they, we had a hard time integrating them into our program because they had such a tough time academically, and uh, they had, you know, had, had weren't used to the kind of discipline that we imposed. Uh, George Felton told me, he said, now, he said, don't worry about Hawk. He said, you know, he'll miss some practices, but he won't miss any games. I said, like hell he will. He, he, he misses any practice, he won't play in any game. So sure enough, uh, you know, uh, they, they had some things to get used to. So it was, a, it was a transition period, but maybe the best year I've ever had in coaching because you're in coaching in high school to, to develop good citizens and to develop good people and to, and to, to, to send people on a, on a good journey. And I think with those two kids – uh, they both came from meager backgrounds and I had to be sure I kept them with me after school because Walter would be over at his girlfriend's house and I had to go get him. I, and everybody asked me, why do you treat those kids so special? You know, you do things for them. You wouldn't do for the others. I said, because if you knew where they came from and what they've been through, you treat them special too. Of course, not everybody would, but I'd take them out to dinner. So I, <laughs> then they'd go with me to dinner and then we'd go to the game. I only screwed up one time. Walter didn't show up for the bus, so I said, "Start the bus. We're going." He had gotten, he had had a flat tire or something. Somebody bringing him to the game, and so he came down to GW and walked in in the middle of the first quarter, and I didn't play him uh, till the second half. You know, as a little bit of punishment, probably cost us the ball game, but uh, that didn't matter. Uh, he learned a lesson that you know he's he had he, he better get there. So. But it, it's, and then the, the guidance lady, Julian, and so much of this, you know, even today, it just, it breaks my heart that the race in this country is, is, is what it is because those kids, the guidance lady told me, she said, Red, he said, you're trying to get those kids in college. I said, I'm going to get them in college. And she said, I'll tell you what, she said, you can't get them in any college in the United States. And if you did, they couldn't stay a week because they don't have the grades. They haven't had the background. I said, well, let's wait and see. So I got them in Chanute Junior College out in Kansas, took them down, put them on the plane, Chanute Junior College. Walter made Junior College All-American. They both got their Junior College degree. Walter went to Utah and started two years. Uh, and Skippy went to uh, Oral Roberts and started his first year. And the second year he started and then he hurt an ankle. And when he came back, the coach uh, was from New York, and he'd brought nine players with him from New York. So he didn't put Skippy back in the lineup, so Skippy left. But 
Walter ended up being the the, the, play, the director of the of the community center down at Bellish Crossroads, has the gymnasium named after him. And Skippy was a uh, even though he was 12 hours short of his degree, uh, being in college was a good experience for him, and he became the regional manager for Melco Shoes. So both of them, along with another guy, Roland Holland, who came, who was a really bright kid who went got an architecture degree from school out in Ohio. I forget where they shot those people, you know, whatever school it was, you know. But uh, it, it was a year where we really did something for people that worked out well for them. And they did something for us that really worked out well for us. That's, and it's like I say, the student body just embraced those kids. Uh, jump, Walter, jump. That's the way it was. <laughs> We had a packed house every night. We took 17 buses to the state tournament. We won in the first round, and uh, we lost in the second round to Patrick Henry, who had a a, a real good team. They were runner-up to WNL. WNL beat us by one point during the regular season. We had two free throws to to win the game and missed both of them. But WNL went down state and won by 30. So uh, we had a really good basketball team. If I could have kept them just one more year. Uh, Nobody could have touched us, but uh, the main thing was the humanity in the whole thing. There was 150 kids or so that came from Luther Jackson to Woodson, and for the most part, uh, they were integrated pretty well, but we had our problems, you know. They weren't used to the academics, and George Felton used to call it the pro league. You could go out on the blacktop, and you'd see 15 or 20 kids out there playing. You know they were out of class. He called it the pro league. They, they, they couldn't cut it in the classroom, so they'd ask the teacher if they'd go play ball. I don't know why in the hell the teacher let them do it, but um, mm. but it was a great it was a great experience. I don't think we've ever had a year where we we uh, have made as big a contribution educationally as we did that year. I don't think so. Well, you, when you added a bunch uh, a whole lot of African American players to the to the talent pool for the first time, did it change yeah. the way the game? Did it change the way the game was played? right away at the game change in Northern Virginia? Well, I don't know. That, that's a hard question to answer, Julian. I, I just know that the, the, the principal asked me when I applied for the job what kind of basketball I wanted to play. And I said, well, that depends on the people that you have to play with. I said, if we have the right talent, we'll play an up-tempo game to take advantage of their talents. And if we don't, we'll play a more control game. So to me, the game of basketball, the key word is control. If you can control the ball in the game at top speed and provide more scoring opportunities for your team, that's what you should do. But if you don't and the other team has better players, then you've got to limit the number of possessions and take advantage of the possessions that you have. So uh, I think with, with, with that group, we played a semi-up tempo, but uh, Walter was a great rebounder. He, set the re he averaged 20 rebounds a game for the whole season. Now figure that out. 20 rebounds. I don't think anybody had ever done that because Walter uh, was just an exceptional player. We, we played DeMatha over at DeMatha and the gym was cold and, and we got behind, but Walter was playing against a guy named Big Sid Catlett, who's about 6'8 and went to Notre Dame, made All-American, played in the pros, I think. But uh, Walter was guarding Big Sid inside and so they run a little, some, little X pattern inside and they throw it to Big sit on the block, and he goes up for layup, and Walter pinned it on the board. So he, they ran the same play on the opposite side, and he went up, and Walter pinned that on the board. Mm -hmm. So after that, Big Sid went out to the free throw line and started shooting jumpers, 6'8", because Walter at 6'4", mm -hmm. could guard anybody. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to the NIT game when he was a senior at Utah. He was guarding Dean the Dream Memager. Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, but he's, well, the old coach Gardner started him guarding the six nine guy inside uh, for Marquette, but Dean went for twenty two in the first half. So he switched Walter off the big guy inside and put him on Dean Memmerger in the second half. Dean Memmerger ended up with twenty four. He got two free throws on Walter. He's the best mm -hmm. defense. I know Tommy Amker was the defensive player of the year in the NCAA, but I guarantee you Walter Hawkins was the best defensive player I've ever coached. And I'll have to tell Tommy, I'm sorry about that, but Walter Hawkins was, a, I mean, Moses Malone came to camp one day and they played a counselor's game and Moses couldn't get a shot off. Moses finally walked over and said, sub me in coach, sub me in. 
So wow. that's yeah. That's that's the kind of defensive player you want. Yeah. Well, in in the mid seventies now, uh, moving on, and you know, schools are most mostly integrated. Uh, you know, the western part of the county took a little bit longer to, for them to become a lot of black players and a lot of black students. But the schools schools are integrated. In the seventies, you had you had you had the not not the Nakis. Um, you yes. Had, uh, Chris and you had uh, I forgot the brothers. It was a date. Uh, Jeff, Jeff. Jeff. It was Jeff. Not, yeah. And you had and you, you had some really solid teams. And then what you had Don McCool was building programs at, at West Springfield and then Mount Vernon. You know Charlie yeah. Charlie Charlie was getting into coaching and in, in in at Lee. And then you had you yeah. know Hensley went from Edison to to yeah. Lake Braddock. And then you had Wickline uh, going yeah. over to Jefferson from Foster. It was really a lot of great coaches and a lot of basketball being played in the nineteen seventies, wasn't there? Well, hey, I can tell you, you can look all day and you won't find anybody around today that could coach with that group. Clint Hanna was at Madison and then after him, George McClain. And uh, like you said, Wickline was a very good coach. Charlie Thompson was a very good coach. McCool was a very good coach. I mean, Carl Hensley, you know, you play against Carl Hensley's zone, you better have a lead going into the fourth quarter because that zone could, that zone would choke you. (laughs) Yeah. You weren't so. taking those easy jumpers like you were in the first quarter, but no, the coaching the coaching was great. And here's the thing, Julian, uh, I left uh, Woodson after 35 years and went to the to the Catholic League to the WCAC because everybody says you know they all, they have two or three teams a year rated in the top 25 in Street and Smiths and in, in the USA Today. Hell, when I was at Paula Six one year, we were rated in 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 the top 25 for a while for a few weeks. But uh, the thing was, everybody thinks that's the great coaches over there. Hey, they're full of it. <laughs> the best coaches I ever coached against, uh, outside of Joe Gallagher and Morgan Wooten, of course, were the guys out here in Northern Virginia, like McCool and Hensley uh, and Wickline. And, and I mean, there's it's great coaches out here. And before that, at T.C. Williams, you know, uh, Mike Henson didn't get enough credit. Oh, yes. They, Mike Henson. Uh, kept the lid on that thing. In Alexandria, you know, it's a tough gig over there, you know, because you got a lot of street kids. And Mike was a good disciplinarian, and, and he kept them in line. Uh, you know, they beat us three times in 1977. They beat us at home by 15, at TC by 15. They beat us by 15 in the district tournament. And then we said, we'll see you next week. So we won two games. I don't know how we got in the regional final with the 15 and 10 record, but – we met them in the finals, and I don't know if you recall the game, but there were 8,000 people there. That's the biggest crowd they've ever had at wow. Robinson. And mm. uh, and uh, we had we had two good players. I had Rusty Unberger and Armin Mancini, and the other three guys were complimentary players. So we had a little red light, green light game going, and uh, the only two guys could shoot, and if it wasn't a layup, were Mancini and, and Rusty. So at the half, the score was 19 to 16, and our game was winning, and Mike got – he didn't like that. So they came out and got in a zone defense and decided they were going to stick those big guys, Anthony Young, 6'7", and Holloway, 6'5", back in the back. And and we'd miss, and they'd get control of the game. And we said, no, we're not playing that game. Either we held the ball. And I didn't plan to do it, but they dictated that we do it. So we held the ball. And at the end of the third quarter, we, found, we decided to take a shot with about five or six seconds to go, and we threw it inside, and the guy – shot it and our guy tipped it in. They called it no basket, which would have cut it to 19 to 18. So the whole fourth quarter, they stole it one time, went down and shot it and missed it. And we got it back. So the game went to, to the end and we scored with about, oh, I guess a minute to play, maybe a minute and a half to cut it to 19, 18. We had them shaken. And I said, surely they'll go down and take a quick shot. And Mike being a smart guy. So I say he didn't get enough credit he held the damn ball because he knew that we we couldn't foul him quick enough to put him in the bonus. So by the time we committed the sixth foul and put him in the bonus, there was like eight seconds to go. And uh, I told our guys exactly who they were going to throw it into, and we tried to draw the charge on uh, little Willie Jackson coming out of the stack. And he jumped right by my guy in a hurry and caught the ball, and he was dribbling right toward our basket like he was going to lay it in. And the crowd went, no. And he dribbled right under the basket, stopped in the corner, and threw a perfect pass to Anthony Young at the rim, and he tomahawked it at the buzzer, and we lost 21 to 18. So I went down to shake hands with Mike, and he was shaking. I'll tell you, he was shaking 
like he had St. Vitus dance because he, you know, we, we scared the pants off of him. But we were 15 and 10 and had nothing to lose. And when they, you know, we'd been happy to play that little cozy game. But that that's maybe the most tense game I've ever been involved in. It was tense. Little Willie would come over to the bench and say, Red, we're going to steal it. I said, no, you're not. Really. <laughs> because at that time, you had to throw it across the hash mark. Yeah. Every 30 seconds, they kept time. See, you had to. And so he stole it coming up back across the hash mark one time. They went down and shot it. We got it back. But 21 to 18, and they went to the state and won by 30. And there's another chance for, you see, we got cheated out of the state. We only one team went to the state. The best state tournament was when we had eight teams. Two teams go from each from each region, and you had a real tournament. And a lot of times, the runner-up from one of the regions would win it. So. Yeah. Was that, is that TC team? A lot of people think it's one of the best high school teams in the history of, of the Northern, Northern uh, uh, region. Would you, would you agree with that? I think it's the best. Yeah. I don't think, I, I don't think I've seen a team better than they had everything you need. They had Willie, little Willie Jackson was a great point guard. Craig Harris, uh, who played for me in the capital classic that year was a very good scorer. Boo Richardson, the left wing player was a little taller than Craig, about six, one good score, good player. And inside they played Walt Holloway who went to Florida and played football. He was about six, four, six, five and two forty, and had big Anthony young six, seven who could, you know, jump and play inside. They just had it all, you know, and they had two or three guys off the bench that could play, you know, so no, I haven't seen a better team in Northern Virginia than that. No, I, I would have to say that. Yeah. So we, we, we were talking about the coaches, uh, the strong coaching staffs in Northern uh, Virginia at that time. Did you get along with most of the coaches after, after the game was over? Or there were some coaches that there was some, some tension? Like, you know, obviously there's always the McCool Thompson few that we, we've talked about. <laughs> but did you, did you get along with most of the coaches? Oh yeah. I got along with them. I, you know, Don was always uh, an enigma. You know, he's a, uh, Don was a very good coach, but he uh, he didn't like to lose. And sometimes he, he might shake your hand, but he wouldn't be happily. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the other guy, yeah, the other guys, Wickline and I have been friends since the boys club. We went to the boys club in Alexandria and played baseball against each other when we were, when I was 16 and he was a little younger. Uh, you know, got along fine with most of the guys. That's, that's fine, you know, but uh, – uh, everybody has their own way of doing things. And, uh, you know, Don, like I say, Don had his way of doing things. It wouldn't have been my way and uh, a lot of other people's way, but uh, he was a good coach. He won. So, you know, that's how you, the only way you can judge a coach in high school is wins and losses. The only thing about Don is that he was the coach at the year we went to the state, he was the coach at Falls Church and we beat them three times to go to the state. And he did uh, uh, something about that year. You know, he asked me at a coaches meeting one night. He said, you think you're a better coach than me? And I said, Don, I don't think I'm a better coach than anybody. I'm just taking care of my business. You take care of yours. But he would he would he would get a, a little upset. You know, then he left Falls Church and went to West Springfield. And we beat him the first eight times over there. And then uh, he got that program built up. And then when it looked like it was going to be a little downturn, then he'd left and jumped over to Hayfield and stayed there one year and then jumped to Mount Vernon. Uh, I'd say that's pretty opportunistic. My feeling was that I, I stayed at Woodson through some damn bad years. I mean, we had some, some years where we had no players. But mm. but I believe that if you make a commitment and the people there like the work I did and I like the people I work for, I wasn't going to jump around and, hey, listen, right there at Robinson, Harry Smith tried – Twice I turned him down to come to Robinson. He said, come over here. He said, we can make a ton of money with this big gym and you go to the state. And I, I came just a hair, just a hair going over there with him twice. And mm. South Lakes, when, when George went to South Lakes, he came and asked me twice to come to South Lakes. And I almost did. But in the end, I stayed at Woodson, you know, uh, mm. just, just the loyalty thing. I, you know, I really liked the school and it paid off. We got the gym named after me and, we won a bunch of games and we, we weren't, uh, you know, people say we didn't win a regional championship, but we did. <laughs> we were runner up four times, but in 1965, uh, 66 season, we were, uh, if you look in the program, it's, we were listed as co-regional champions. So if you're co-regional champions, you're a regional champion. Uh, WNL, Edison and, and, and Woodson were co-regional champions that year. Then the next year, they changed the rules again. So, you know. Yeah. Coach, I've always wondered, 
Ross, Roscoe Dean almost won a state championship at, at Lee with Bucky Roman in 77. Right. Um, and he was the varsity coach at Robinson when I got there. Just a decent guy. Had a good reputation, but but the wheels just fell off at Robinson. Do you have any idea why it just didn't work over there for him? Well, you you got your you got your thing a little backed up. I'm I'm the resident historian, Julian. It wasn't he. The state championship team wasn't with Bucky Roman. Bucky might have been on the team. I don't th- I don't know. No, but... no, no, no. State state winners up. State winners up. Remember they lost yeah. to Clyde. They lost to Clyde yeah. Austin. Yeah. Down in, down in, yeah. Yeah, that's another story. Clyde used to come to my stay at my house two or three days a summer and, and, and do the camp for us. But anyhow, <laughs> the, the team that was runner up in the state was Greg Dennis and Mike Tissaw were the two <laughs> main players. Yes, Those were, yes, yes. Bucky, got, Romans, yeah. Bucky Roman came later. But here, here's the thing. Roscoe was a good coach. I tell you, he's a pretty smart guy. And I was listening to the game down there, and, and something happened that I thought was a little bit of a mistake. Of course, Roscoe's dead right now. He can't refute this. Yeah. And, but down, I'm listening to the game on the radio, and they were playing Portsmouth, I think, and Portsmouth had a pretty good team. And they were up like 16 in the, in the third quarter, and uh, they, they were on their way to victory. And Mike Tissaw got his fourth foul. And it was late in the third quarter, and they were still up about 14 or 15. But he took Tissaw out. And immediately, the other team pressed because Tissaw had been posting up against pressure in the backcourt. He was big, and they just pitch it up, and he'd throw it ahead. So they were handling the pressure, no problem. But when Tissaw went out, the other team up to pressure, and they cut the lead by, you know, just cut it almost in no time so that uh, or by the middle of the fourth quarter, the game was a, a two-point game. And then it went to the wire. He put Tissaw back in. It went to the wire, and they ended up getting beat. Now, philosophy-wise, here's the thing. There was no shot clock in high school, and Dennis was a good guard, and there was somebody else that pretty good. If it had been me, <laughs> I would never have taken Tissaw out of the game because – I left him in until he fouled out. Tell him, don't foul. We need to give two points. You give two. Don't foul out. But even if he fouled out in the middle of the fourth quarter, he's still going to be up 14 to 50. You think you can't hold it for four minutes? I think you can. So to me, it's a philosophy thing. If it's a guard, like I got caught against DeMatha one night, the first time we played him out here. My little guard, John Alexander, got his fourth foul with about seven, eight minutes to go. And I had to take him out. And we were up good at the time. By the time I got him back in, uh, the guard that, like I said, I had no players when I got over there, and John was the only one. He came up from Woodbridge. By the time I got him back in the game, it went to the wire, and we got beat two in overtime. But, but we're we're downstate with Roscoe. If he, I'd have just gone ahead and played this all till he fouled out and then held the damn ball. Now, mm. you know, that's that was his decision, and you know he he thought he did the right thing, and that's the book. Guy gets four fouls, you take him out. That's not always true. Al McGuire. Uh, Marquette used to say he played guys with four fouls a hundred times and only two times they foul out. He said, just tell them don't foul. Whatever happens, if you have to get two points, you don't, you don't foul. But yeah, but Roscoe was a good coach. He was a good coach. And, and Tissaw and Dennis were devastating. Tissaw came up to the Dapper Dan and played for me. I coached the Dapper Dan for Sonny Vaccaro up in Pittsburgh and they were looking for a, a big guy to take. And I said, bring Mike Tissaw. And they said, ah, hell, that guy can't play. Well, I'll tell you what. He put Sam Bowie on roller skates and ran him all around and pushed him all around the gym and manhandled him. And Mike was a tough guy. I, I enjoyed coaching Mike. He was he was a good guy. He was a good guy. Uh, yes. So what so what about uh what about Pete Holbert? So Pete Pete was a guy who came around and he's he's a six foot five, six, six guy who's shooting way outside at a time when, you know, most of the time the big guys stayed inside. Yeah. When when did you when did, you, when did you first meet Pete, and how, what was his development like? Well, I lived in a place called Pine Spring across the street on Route 50 from Falls Church High School, and Pete lived in the same neighborhood. And uh, I didn't know his family well, but uh, I lived in – when I got the head job at Woodson, I still lived in, in, in Pine Spring. And when Peter's father saw that I was going up there, he bought a house in Truro right down the street. So it was kind of an inside job. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it, but he told me his father uh, had followed me and wanted him to play for me. So he, he uh, bought a place up there. And uh, Peter was a good player as a young kid. He came to camp, aggressive, could score. And, of course, 
uh, I put him on the on the JV uh, his freshman year. Uh, he was about six three then, but a pretty good player. But he scored thirty two against Dematha, and I brought him up the next day. I didn't see any sense in leaving him down there, you know. Now he didn't, you know, he missed that game experience, but he was playing against better players and practice every day, and they gave him an education, believe me. Uh, so I had him up as a sophomore. He started three years, and he would have started as a freshman if he'd been a little tougher. Chris Naki would tell you that, but uh, Peter Peter could always score the ball. And, of course, you know, like that principal asked me what kind of basketball I was going to play, I made sure. That's one of the things about me, Julian, that, that people don't really know is that I'm not an offensive genius, but I'm pretty smart. And I've had seven guys lead the region in scoring and two more that were runner up. And it's because I know how to feature a good player. The problem at Woodson is you have, you might get a good player too, but you also got two or three players that are average and you got to be able to maximize your, your strength. So we ran Holbert at the three, we ran Holbert at the four, we ran him at the two, we ran him where we could get the most out of him. And, we would run something called a sideline quick break, which I, I invented, and we ran it, and Peter would run the four cut to get to the block, and we killed it inside with him. He averaged like 20, 28, 29 as a junior and 30 as a sophomore, as a senior, and it was because we featured him, and uh, uh, everybody else fed off him. If, if they were going to try to stop him, then the other guys are going to get better shots, uh, you know, uh, so – I'm not saying that he 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 went to Maryland and he, he he did okay. Lefty only played him when he was played against zones and when he needed scoring, but he was a better basketball player than that. He 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 was a pretty good handler, pretty good rebounder, pretty good player. But he scored 30 points a game because we put him in a position to score 30 points a game. That that's what coaching's about, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, so. Uh... I talked to Andy Heck last week. I'm not sure if you heard the, the podcast with Andy, um, but I also have talked to Tommy as uh, Amber Kurzweil. I'm, I'm pretty sure you heard that one. And we, you know, we talked about the TC Woodson matchup. You actually uh, referred to it earlier, and this is in the early '80s. And, you know, every year you guys would beat TC during the regular season. One year you beat them twice, and yep. they, they all they some they somehow would find a way to edge you guys out in the uh, regionals. And again, as you mentioned earlier, only one team would go to state at the time. Yep. Do, you ever, do, you ever th- do you ever think about those matchups? A- Andy says, Andy Heck says, he still thinks about, he thinks he, he, he missed the box out that on a foul shot that allowed TC a three-point play. And when Tommy went down the other end and almost tied the game, or almost won the game at the buzzer, but it was disallowed. Right, uh, but do you ever do you ever think about those games and those those matchups with TC? Well, yeah, but uh, you know, uh, I, I know Andy missed that box out, and Andy <laughs> Andy was big enough to chase a bear with a switch. But I have a I have something that I've lived by that the people are human, and you coach them the best you can. And if Andy missed that box out, I don't think I coached him well enough because I should have had him in that situation and. And, and, and made it more clearly how to do that. But, but the guy just, the guy went in too soon. That's the whole thing. <laughs> the, the referees aren't going to call it that late in the game, but Andy, we always say he go, I go. And, but he went and Andy didn't catch him, didn't block him off. And it, that ended up hurting us. But that, and I never said a word to Andy about that and never would, uh, you know, uh, when uh, Tommy's senior year, we, uh, we had a one point lead with, uh, uh, I guess that was the same year. We had a one point lead with about uh, well, maybe 10 seconds and they had time out and I told them where the ball was gonna go, who it was gonna go to. And we trapped the ball on the right baseline, forced a very bad shot, which just skimmed over the rim. And Pat Whitting, for some reason, was on the backside rebound responsibility. And he thought, well, I just go up and catch the ball, but the guy went up and rebounded over his back. So, uh, that that cost us, you know. I've thought about that a lot, you know. Uh, but you know what? That's that's basketball. You know, you can't. Uh, hey, I, if if, if uh, well, you know, if little things like that didn't happen in basketball, it wouldn't be such an interesting game. You know, it's uh, it's you know, we had the math of beat one night, and the damn Keith Bogans just reached around, knocked the ball out of my guy's hands. I thought he fouled him, 
and we end up, we end up going down and tying the game. And after the game, the kid said to me, he said, Coach, I lost a game for us. I said, hell, that's crazy. You didn't lose a game for us. There's 60 plays in a game of basketball, and any one of them could have lost a game for us. But in my heart, I knew if he would just protected the ball a little better. But, again, I should have coached him better. I only had him for one year. It's a kid that came to us from Centerville. I had uh, Dempsey was his name, Greg Dempsey, pretty good player. He didn't like playing for McCool or whoever was out there. McCool, I guess, was helping out or helping Todd or whoever was coaching there. It's, yeah, it's probably Todd Crowley or – yeah, probably yeah. Todd Crowley. I think McCool helped him in between coaching jobs or something. Yeah. Anyhow, he, uh, he said, I lost a game for us. I said, no, he didn't. You know, so you just can't pin it on a kid. A kid's a high school kid, 17 years old. Uh, you know, that's why you don't talk about games after the game. You talk about games the next day. Everybody feels bad if you get beat. Everybody feels good if you win. What the hell is he used to talking about? You know, yeah. I'm, yeah. I'm very old school, very old school. Mm. So uh, another one of your great players, you, as you said earlier, you, you put a lot of players in Division One schools was Greg Williams, and he had a four-year yeah. varsity career. Uh, what about him? Where does where Greg rate among your great players? Obviously, he's got to be up there somewhere. And what are some of your memories of, of, of Greg as a player? Well, when Greg – I was uh, I was somewhere one day. His father played at Jeb Stewart, was a good player, Greg Sr. And I was somewhere one day, 7-Eleven or something. I was down at Bailey's Crossroads area doing something, and Greg was there, and he was carrying little Greg in his arms. He was about a year old. And Greg said to me, Coach, this is my son, Greg Jr. I said, well, he might, might have been two. He was carrying him. I remember that. He was up in his arms. And he said, he said, if you're still at Woodson when when Greg gets to high school, I want him to play for you. And I said, that's nice, Greg. I never thought another thing about it. Well, Greg uh, grew up and in, in the Bellis Crossroads area. And sure enough, he Greg came to me and he said, I'm going to move up to Woodson so Greg can play for you. And I said, that's great. You know, <laughs> so – because I, I, I didn't really know whether he was a good player or not, but he was a very good player. Scored a lot of points. He was very advanced. You see, at the time, uh, he, he was over at a little place over there. Little eight, He went to the eighth grade at the same place Keith Bogans went. I forget the name of the school played for a guy over there, but that, that's when his dad decided he was going to bring him to Woodson. So he rented an apartment and moved up to Woodson, and it created a little bit of a political stir. Tom Davis, the uh, supervisor from that area over in Bailey's Crossroads, called me and said, Ray, what's going on? I said, what? <laughs> How come Greg Williams at Woodson? He doesn't live in Woodson. I said, yes, he does. He lives in an apartment right across the street. And he said, no, he doesn't. He lives in Bailey's Crossroads. He said, How come his sister goes to Annandale then? I said, well, Tom, I don't know about his sister, but I know. If you come up here, I'll take you over to his apartment, and maybe you better check on why his sister's at Annandale, not why Greg's at Woodson. So, Tom and I laugh about that because I ran for Board of Supervisors and he helped the campaign. We've been friends for a long time, but Greg was 100% legit. And as a freshman, just to tell you how good he was, we had a mediocre team when he came on board. We were okay. We were one of those teams that win you 14, 15 games, but we were down in Annadale in the first game. And the seniors had been screwing it up for three quarters, to be honest with you. And so in the fourth quarter started, I said, now, give the ball to the young boy and get the hell out of the way. And he went for 20 in the fourth quarter and scored 29 for the game. And from that moment on, there was no question about who was going to be the guy, the go-to guy on our team. And we ended up having a pretty good team. The difference between Greg, Greg was, a, 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 as, as, as Demetra said, Greg was a points guard, not a point guard. He was a scorer. So we played him at the point because we didn't really have, you know, somebody else could bring the ball up the floor as well as he did. But he was a, a scorer, and he had a scorer's mentality. But uh, he was a totally different guy than Tommy Amaker. You know, uh, Tommy was a, a, pure, a pure, point, uh, pure point guard. Pure point guard, who I had to beg to shoot the ball. I had a, I, Finally, I said, when I hold up one finger, you know what that means? That means penetrate and go to the basket and create something. And I started create. I started giving him the one finger a lot of the time because he would be content to just give the ball up, pass the ball off, and, and go about his business. Greg was was uh, had a strong desire to score. That that's the difference between those two. Greg's our all-time leading scorer. He scored more than Holbert, basically because wow. he started all four years and Holbert didn't. Holbert only started three years. Holbert scored eighteen hundred and some points and. 
Greg scored 1,900 and some, but uh, that, uh, again, that's a, a situation where we we put Greg in a position to be successful. And he went to Florida and had a good career, but not a great career, not as good as I thought he would have. Uh, I think he was all Southeastern Conference his senior year in the preseason. Uh, but uh, he had a good career, but not a great career. Tommy, on the other hand, went to Duke and had a great career. So I guess the difference is, you know, uh, one loved to score uh, and one didn't, but, you know, the guy that didn't did the all around things a little better. Greg was a good defensive player too, though. Tommy was a great defensive player. When you got a guy like Tommy, you put him on the ball, you can pretty much control the game both ends. So, you know, but Greg was, you know, I, I'm very fond of Greg. Greg was a, a, a real good kid to coach. And I'm, you know, the four years that we were up there, I think, I'm not sure. Tommy, we won <laughs> – we won the district all four years with Tommy when, you know, we were in the Potomac district, we won that. And then we were, they moved us, I guess that's another thing they legislated against me. They moved us over to the big district where we played to play against TC Williams, Robinson, Lake Braddock. And Bob Carson said, now you're over here with the big boys. You won't be winning so easy. Shit. We won it three years in a row. So uh, I guess we did all right, you know, be playing with the big boys, but you know, when they got, you know, 3000 students in the school and they've got the, They've got uh, the advantage of having uh, being able to identify the seventh and eighth grade players there. That's a hell of an advantage, you know, and, and our school reduced at that time down to about 16, 1700. So we were up against it. Football is a numbers game. Basketball, not so much so, but it helps to have a large student body. But no, it was, uh, you know, it was a good league. I mean, coaching against Carl and coaching against uh, Mike Henson, you know, good. Yeah, uh, one thing that, you, uh, that you've been able to do in your career as a coach is a lot of your assistant coach and also your players have become good coaches themselves. There's Tommy Amaker, there's Greg, Gary, Coach Gary Reedy, uh, there's, Dip, there's Dip Matris. It must give you a lot of satisfaction when your future, when your former uh, coaches or, or uh, players become head coaches in their own right. Well, you know, the whole thing, uh, Julian, and you missed Chris Naki, who was the head coach at American oh. University for five yeah. years. <laughs> Yeah, we, sorry had about three, that. Yeah. We, had, we had three guys that went on and became major college coaches. And I'm calling dip a major college because when you're a division two coach and you're in the final four one year and the final two one year uh, in division two, because there's nine million schools in division two, it's, it's hard to get to Springfield, but dip, you know, at one time, I don't know, he, he wouldn't have mentioned this, but at one time about three, four years ago, one five year period, he had the best winning record of any coach in the United States. He was something like 138 and 29, better than Shashevsky, better than better than anybody, better than Roy Williams, better than Bayham. He had the best record of any coach, Division One and Two, for a five-year period, and that and that's so I consider him a major college coach. He runs a hell of a good program down there, and he comes up here and he gets guys like the, the little point guard from Marshall and goes down there and and gets to the Final Four with him. He's a hell of a basketball coach. Now, his brother's a pretty good coach, too. Um, yes, he is. But, I, but I'm partial to Dip because, you know, Dip played for me. And, you know, I, I, I was telling – he told you a story about tonight. He scored 37 against Mount Vernon. And that, again, it's a contrast in styles between Don McCool and me. Uh, we run multiple offense, multiple defense. You know, if one defense doesn't work, I can throw that out and pull up three more. You know, that's – we, we coached our kids in the total game of basketball. Now, Don is like a Bobby Knight guy. He believes in one defense and play it well, and he believes in one offense and run that well. That's good. You know, that's that's the two opposite poles. I happen to be a Dean Smith guy, not a Mike Krzyzewski guy. Mike and I used to argue about defense and everything. But anyhow, that night that Dip, Dip says he went and shot a lot of layups. He didn't shoot a lot of layups. They, they, Don decided that if he could stop, if he could keep the ball out of Dip's hands, that they'd beat us. And he was probably right. So we run the quick break, but we also have an alternate break, an A break. So Don would run to the baseline and front dip and not let him catch the ball inbounds, which is great for us because we just ran the A break. We just threw it to the alternate receiver, cut dip down the middle, and he went right down the middle. And I know he made at least 15 foul line jumpers because there was no three-point shot in those days. He scored 37 points. And the thing about it is Don hadn't moved yet. That's what he decided to do, and that's what he was going to do. 
and it, it blew up in his face, but the dip just, I mean, dip just ate his lunch for it. And, and it wasn't layups, it was jump shots. And dip had a night to remember. I mean, at 37, that's probably in the top seven or eight games anybody's ever scored at Woodson. Gabe Oliverio has the record with 50. David Oliverio scored 43. Holbert scored 43. But 37 is right up there. That's that's a lot of points. And uh, mm. he won the game. We won, He had a real good team. He had that kid that went on to George Mason, Brian. Brian Miller? Yeah. Oh, oh yes. Yes, he did. He had, he had Frank Smith, Brian. Tracy yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. He had, he had Brian Miller and and Frank Smith, and, and we won the game down at Mount Vernon. Uh, and Don, he didn't adjust. I bet that's his philosophy. If, if, if we decide we're going to do it this way, we do it that way. That's that's different from what I do it. But Tommy Hamaker told me, I called him, the, uh, but after he'd been down at Duke for about two weeks, I called him. I said, well, how are you doing? He said, fine. I said, how's basketball? He said, good. I said, well, have, uh, have you, how are you beginning to learn their system? He said, coach. He said, I learned the whole system last week. He said, it took me a year to learn yours because, you know, we did things in a complex fashion. You see, the, Howard Garfinkel used to call my players slow white suburbanites. And I said, yeah, Howard, but they're smart suburbanites who know how to play the damn game. And Tommy is a prime example. You know, the thing about coaching high school basketball, first thing you got to do is you got to get them to love the game. You got to make it fun and, and you got to make it competitive. And you got to develop them into as players and as people. So, you know that that's our main thrust. The fact that I didn't win this or didn't win that, that's that's irrelevant. The fact of the matter is that my players that played for me are among my closest friends today. Play golf with Chris Naki and Matt Kaysen, and talk to Tommy probably once or twice a week. You know, uh, Holbert texts me, although Holbert's. Holbert's gone off the deep end. He's a trumper, and so he and I don't talk much lately. But that's all right too. I, I love the guy, and I love I love what he did for us as a player. But he's uh, that's that's his choice, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what kind of what kind of player was Naki? So I, I I you know he was before my time slightly. I, I love his work on Maryland Radio. Uh, good what, player. What kind of player was he? Good player. Good. He, he he's a good solid player. He's the only player that I ever got a call from the director of the CIA to talk about his son. His, his father, Hank Knocky, I don't know if you knew this, he was the first player drafted in the NBA draft in 1946. He was an All-American at Colorado. First guy drafted, first guy drafted in the NBA draft. And he was the acting director. George Bush had moved on to something else, and he was the acting director of the CIA. And Chris was a junior and struggling a little bit. And so, you know, I was still starting him. He was a starter, but his dad said, you know, what he needs, Red, he needs a, a little pat on the back. He said, you know, a word from you would mean a lot. And I said, well, I'll take care of it. So I, I went and talked to Chris. I said, hey, you press him a little bit, but just relax and play. And he did. And the second half of the year, he was great. And uh, we won some big games with him. But the thing about Chris is he wanted to go to Colorado where his dad uh, coached or played. And so I was dealing with the assistant coach and guy went on to, I think the guy's name is Kevin O'Connor. He went on, became general manager of the Lakers and everything, but he was assistant coach at Colorado. So I, t I said, if you let him walk on and if he makes your team said, uh, will you give him a scholarship? He said, Oh yeah, if he makes the team, we'll give him a scholarship. And so Chris went to Colorado. A couple of guys got hurt. He started playing more, had nine points on the road at Nebraska and played really well. And I called him. I said, hey, had you put him on full scholarship yet? He said, well, no, we're going to wait and see how the end of the year goes, which was against his word. So uh, with the game to go, Chris had been in the starting lineup, in and out and playing and doing a good job for me. He had a badly sprained ankle. And the school wouldn't, since he wasn't a scholarship player, they wouldn't pay the medical expenses to take care of. His father had to pay for it. So mm -hmm. I told him, I said, hey, I don't trust those people. You know, they're not treating you right. So he comes back home for the summer and he naturally worked the camp. And so I called Gary Williams. I said, Gary, I got a guy that I think can play for. Gary had just taken the job at AU. I said, I got a guy I think can play for you. You, you need to build your program. You don't have any players yet. Come out and take a look at him at camp. So I set up a counselor's game and Chris was hot as a firecracker. He was handling it, shooting it, 
And, and, and Gary says, I've seen enough. I'll take it. So he went to AU and played for Gary for three years. Well, I guess last year Gary had gone and played for TAP. I'm not sure. But he stayed there as an assistant and, you know, became the head coach. And the thing about it is he – things are unfair in basketball sometimes he had the lowest budget in the in the colonial athletic conference the lowest recruiting budget the lowest overall budget he had to take games with ohio state and ucla to make enough mm. money to, to to run his program and he gave ohio state fits on the road and ucla too he was a hell of a coach i'm telling you a hell of a coach and uh, they let him go so uh, those things happen you know, but the thing about it is they brought in an athletic director who had somebody in mind that he wanted for the job. And it was Art Perry, who was an assistant at Maryland. Well, Art Perry was was Gary Williams. He's on Gary Williams' bad list to this day because he was telling people like Walt Williams, you got to go pro, you got to go to NBA. I've been talking to the scouts and everything. And so Gary found out about it and fired him. So he ended up over as the head coach at AU after Chris left, and he was horrendous. Yeah, I think he won four or five games, lost about 20, didn't last two years. They let a good man go to hire somebody who couldn't coach. So, mm. you know, it's unfortunate, but, uh, hey, Chris was a hell of a coach. Uh, and the thing about mm. our guys is we have a thing. We have a thing that one of my players who became a head coach at Marshall High School, little Bobby Forrest, he came up with this idea. He said, Coach, he said, I got a, a, a motto I'm, I'm going by. Said, Thank the game. So I wrote a little something up about that. Thank the game. That's what we tried to do all those years is to have our players love the game, think the game. And if you do that, you know, you can go on and play in college because people know when they, a guy comes from your school, whether he's fundamentally sound or not, you know, you know Rick Barnes told me one time, he said, really, he said, I watch your teams play. He was down there that night, dip scored to 37. And he said, you know, I've, I've been all over the country and I've seen a lot of coaches play. And he says, I, I don't, remember seeing anybody that gets more out of what you have with what you have. Mm. And you see, that's the thing. You, you, Julian, how many, how many African-American players do you think I had at Woodson in 35 years? While uh, Hayfield, Hay, Hayfield, mm -hmm. South Lakes, Wakefield, uh, Malvern, all stopped with, with all black athletes. Mm -hmm. How many do you think I had in 35 years? I'd say probably 30. Nope. 11. Mm. Wow. 11. You know, and what, what I used to get them started. What? All right. All right. So that that that's one of the things coaching about Woods. And I stayed, I stayed there, but uh I, I was deprived a little bit. I'd have been better off coaching over at Eastern High School in DC. I could have done more for the kind of kids I needed to work with. Yeah. Um well coach, you got you got some more time or do you, or do you have to go? Well, I tell you what, I got to go see that if, if if there's more time needed, I can I can do that, you know. But I got to go see this construction guy just showed up at my house, so okay. I, I got to. What, what, why don't we? Have, much, why don't we? What's that? I was just gonna say, can we pause it or can you get we get together tomorrow or something? Yeah, I tell you, I tell you what, this is this has been great. Why don't we? Uh, why, why don't we do this as a part one, and we'll do a part two either later on this week or whenever whenever you're Perfect. ready. I, I can talk about. You know, coaching at private versus coaching at public. I'll, I'll yeah. like get your, get, get your thoughts on the game today. Whether you think the game is too many three pointers and layups, just talk yeah. like that. But why don't we why don't we why don't we pause now and we can do it later on this week? You got okay. it. All right, sign me off. Okay, okay. Thanks, Thanks Coach. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks. Okay. Bye bye. Have a good day.